Um, can you all see my screen? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Let me just make it slightly bigger. OK, so I'm going to go mostly um, talking through these points. Um, and I want you to use the emoji like raise your hand feature in Whereby. If, uh, if I'm going too fast, go thumbs down. Um, and if you have a question, you can, you can raise your hand in, uh, in Whereby. And I'll keep an eye on Whereby. Um, all right, so let's get started. So first, I want to talk about what Docker is, actually. Um, people talk about it like it's one monolithic piece of technology, but actually it's a collection of lots of different Linux tools under the hood. So what that means is that um, the thing that runs your containers and the thing that builds your containers and the things that you use to orchestrate these containers are not all the same technology. They are disparate technologies. And it's important to learn them in isolation and trust your knowledge of each layer before you try and use them all together. So under the hood, um, in Linux, the way you interact with anything on your system is through system calls. So opening a file, talking to the network, uh, you know, giving yourself a permission, anything like that is done via system calls. And resources are exposed to every process, such as um, network interfaces or files or um, PIDs. That's a common one. And those are called namespaces. So the way that Docker, Docker works is it filters the system calls and it remaps the namespaces. So what does that actually mean? So when you create a container, what it does is it takes all of the things that the kernel has available, um, like the PID namespace. So the PID namespace is when you create a new process, like let's say bash, um, echo high, that will get a new PID in your system. So PID maybe you know three, two, whatever. And that number increases by one with every process that you start on your system. But when you start a Docker container, it starts over from zero inside the container. And all of the PIDs inside of Docker are mapped to PIDs outside Docker. So what might be PID in zero inside Docker is actually PID you know, two, three, four, whatever outside of Docker. And this is why you can use HTOP on a running Docker container and see the processes inside the Docker container listed in HTOP. So for example, on this server here, um, if I run HTOP, I'll run CTOP first, so you can see that uh, we have containers running for odd slingers, right? So these are all Docker containers. But if I go into HTOP, you can actually find those processes. So you see how we have oddslingers.poker running here? This is not running on the host system. This is running inside of a Docker container. But the PID on the host system is some very high number. And inside of the Docker container, this is PID 0. So this is a really important concept to understand with Docker, because this is the way that Docker deals with everything on your system, not just PIDs. Um, permissions, networking, file descriptors, any kind of resource that can be exposed to a container is going to be mapped from the values inside the container to values on the host. So another good example is permissions. Um, root is UID 0 on the host. Um, but root inside the container is also UID 0. So how does that work? Well, it turns out root inside the container is not UID 0 on the host. So let's say we are user, um, oops, wrong direction. Um, so let's log in as squash. Oops. Whoops, where am I? OK, so I'm user squash right now. Um, if I were to run a Docker container, inside of the Docker container, the root user in Docker container would be UID 0, but that would be mapped to UID 500 on the host. Um, 500 is typically what, uh, oh no, so I'm, I'm UID 1001 right here. So if I launched a Docker container, like Docker run uh, you know, Ubuntu bash, whatever, that would be run as UID 500 on the host system, but it would be UID 0 inside of Docker. Um, is that clear to everyone so far? Give me a thumbs up and whereby if, if, uh, if you're following so far with this concept of mapping resources on the host to resources on the container. Cool. 
OK, so that's just a little bit of background on Docker as a system. Now I'm going to move on to how to write a good Docker file. So a good Docker file um, is sort of a work of art. Uh, it's a little bit hard to know right off the bat um, you know what the best practices are. Uh, it's sort of something that you just have to accumulate over time. But I'm going to try and give you a rundown on what I think the best practices are from using Docker in production for a bunch of years. Um, people are going to have different opinions on how to do this stuff. but uh, generally, there's good reasoning behind uh, different strategies, and I'll go over the ones that I use. So let's do a quick uh, anatomy of a Docker file first. Um, so Docker files are composed of these statements from label and run copy add. Um, they're all highlighted in red here, um, and then the arguments that you pass. So every image uh, starts with a base image. And generally, you'll, you'll pick this from a base image on hub.docker.com. Um, and the official ones start with an underscore. So if you want the node official image, uh, you know you go to underscore node. There are often many different options. There's like Alpine. There's uh, Ubuntu-based images. There's Debian-based images. Um, Alpine will give you the smallest image size. Now, why is that important? Why do you want small image sizes? Well, because people on slow machines or people during development are going to rebuild your image a lot of times. And if the image is a gigabyte, um, it's going to take a lot longer to do development because every time it's going to have to rebuild a, a gigabyte image. So in general, you should try and build your, your image off of the smallest possible base image. Um, the reason why you wouldn't use Alpine, so uh, you know, three Alpine is an option here. Um, that'll give you a really nice small base image. But the problem is not everything is compatible with Alpine. Uh, right? Alpine is a special distribution of Linux built specifically for Docker, and it has a different package manager. So to add packages on Alpine, you do apk add uh, and then dot 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 package name. So if you're using things, um, you know, if you're not familiar with Alpine Linux and you're being frustrated trying to add packages to Alpine or you don't understand, like, uh, you know, Alpine even uses a different C uh, headers in the kernel. Um, so anytime you run into stuff like that, it's, it's probably a good idea just to switch to a, a Debian-based image like Buster. And slim uh, just means use the, the smallest possible image without all this stuff included by default. All right, so let's move on here. Um, don't worry about labels. Uh, you don't really need that. Um, environment. So in general, any kind of global environment uh, that's going to be true for the whole life of your container, you want to define that at the top. So time zones, uh, locales, uh, you know, basically invariants, things that will never change throughout the lifetime of your project, you want those to be near the top. Uh, now, why is that the case? You know, why wouldn't we put this further down? Well, the reason is every line in a Docker file that starts with one of these red statements creates a new layer in Docker. Now, what is a layer? So every time one of these runs, Docker actually snapshots the entire file system being used to build the image. And it takes a diff of all the changes produced on that file system compared to the previous layer. And that becomes your layer. So the way the Docker works is it checksums that diff. And every layer has a checksum. And the cache key for the checksum is the content of the line. So if this line never changes, then Docker assumes that the content of the file system produced by this line will also never change. And so you get this really elegant, easy caching, where as long as everything needed to construct the diff on the file system is in the line, then your cache will be up to date. And you don't have to worry about cache problems. Now, Docker is smart. If you pull in an external file, let's say you do copy uh, you know, package.json from your project into uh, you know, in somewhere inside your project, and then you do run um, npm install, it actually checksums this file and checks, have the contents of the file changed? If so, it'll rerun the whole line and all the subsequent lines after that. So that's why you want lines that don't change very often to be near the top of the file and lines that change very often to be near the bottom, because you don't want it to be rebuilding layers when it doesn't have to. You want to reuse as many cache layers as possible so that Docker is fast. Um, does that make sense so far? Frequently changed things should be near the bottom, including uh, packages, uh, project level packages, things like that should all be near the bottom. And invariants, things that never change, should be near the top. OK, here's a common question. So we inherited from the Python 3.9 Slim Buster image. That gives us uh, that gives us Python. It gives us pip, uh, Python three and pip three out of the box. 
Now, should you run pip3 dash dash upgrade pip uh, inside of the this container? Um, because when you build it, you're probably going to get a warning every now and then saying, you know, warning, uh, you don't have the latest version of pip. Your pip is out of date. Uh, you know, there's a minor version available. But the version of pip that you're using was given to you by this image. So should you upgrade it or should you stay with the one in your image? In general, you should not upgrade it. You should stay with the one in your image and ignore those warnings about being out of date. Um, trust the image that you inherit from to give you the things that it gives you. Don't inherit from an image and then just reinstall the packages that it gives you. Uh, that's generally a bad practice because you're adding additional layers for no reason. You're having the layer of the old version of the package, and then you're adding an yet another layer to upgrade that package. So you should either upgrade the base image or trust the packages that it gives you. Um, don't go upgrading system packages just because you get warnings about them being out of date. That's a common, that's a common thing that people run into with Docker. Um, OK, so what order should you install packages? That's another good question. So notice how we have uh, some apt-get install things up here. And then we have another line of apt-get install things. You know, why don't we just merge those? Um, and then down here, you see we're installing Node. Uh, you know, why not just make these all one line where we install everything? Well, it comes back to, the, to that same thing I was talking about before, where you want to keep frequently changed things further down in the file. So these things, app transport HTTPS, CA certificates, um, you know, a compression library, dumb init, gosu, all of these things are used by the actual uh, packaging container setup itself. They're not project dependencies. They're like system-wide dependencies. So generally, you want to keep system-wide uh, sort of you know, utilities or libraries in a separate layer so that you don't have to reinstall them every time you change project-level dependencies. So Archivebox is a good example, because we have a lot of project-level dependencies. You know, we depend on YouTube DL. We depend on Git and FFmpeg and Chromium. And you know, this stuff changes once a month. But this stuff changes once a year. So you want to keep them as separate layers. And generally, the things that change more often go further down. If something changes a lot more often than something else, then you want to split them into separate layers. All right, another common question is, what is this thing? You know, why am I rmrf ver apt list uh, star every time after I install something? And why do I have to apt get update every time before I install something? You know, if I do it here, you know, why do I have to redo it here? Well, remember, every layer gets cached on its own. So when we install these packages once a year, let's say, it needs to run apt get update when it does that. But then we don't want all of those uh, you know, repository sources that it downloaded to be cached in the Docker image, because that makes your layer unnecessarily wide. You know, when you do apt get update, it downloads, uh, it downloads, you know, like 100 megabytes of stuff. It's probably not that much. It's probably closer to like 30 megabytes of stuff um, of like repository information into ver apt lists. And if you were to include that in your Docker image, that's 20 megabytes of stuff that you're not, you're never going to use that at runtime. So in order to make your layers smaller. You want to clean up everything you possibly can in that layer, all in the same command. It's really important to have it in the same command. If you do this, it defeats the purpose, because now you have two separate layers. You have one layer where you add it and one layer where you remove it. And it's going to include all of that file size into your Docker image. So you have to run the, the cache removal or cache clearing commands in the same line as the, uh, as the command that creates them. And that's why we need to up, both update and remove the update in the same line every time we use apt. Um, and that's also true for NPM. Uh, in general, you want to like uh, NPM, clear, cache, force, something like that. Um, I forget the actual command. But when you use NPM, you probably want to do that there. Now, the exception to that rule is, are you going to use your Docker container for development? Because if you're using it for development, that means you're probably going to run NPM commands inside of your Docker container. So you might do. Docker run, you know, my container, npm install abc, or whatever, some package. If you don't have the cache in the Docker container, it's going to refetch all of your packages from scratch every time you run that. So sometimes you actually want to keep the cache in your Docker container so that during development, you don't have to rebuild the whole cache every time. That's up to you. It depends. Are you shipping a Docker container to users? In which case, you probably want it to be as small as possible with no development tools. Or are you using a Docker container for development and production, in which case you want to keep the cache um, and, and make sure it's, it's relatively fast? OK, so we covered package installation. You start with global, then you work down to your language packages, and then you do your project packages. 
Um, you should not upgrade the, the packages that the base image uh, provides to you. Um, you should clear your packaging caches after running packaging commands. That's what this RM line is doing. Um, and it does make quite a big difference. It's between you know, 50 and 200 megabytes, depending on how many times you do it. Um, in, this is empirically in practice. Obviously, it will vary in, uh, in each situation. All right, so what are multi-stage builds? So multi-stage builds, think about the scenario where you have some NPM packages that depend on Node GYP. So what is Node GYP? You might have seen errors in console related to Node GYP. Node GYP is the thing that builds C libraries into things that you can call from Node. So let's say if you depend on some like um, audio visual codec, let's say like FFmpeg node. This is a hypothetical package. I don't know if it actually exists. But if you were to use this package, um, it probably depends on some C libraries to do really fast audio and video decoding. So when you npm install an FFmpeg node, it actually checks on your system, do you have um, a C++ compiler? Do you have Python? And do you have Node GYP? Uh, and I think also make is needed as well. So G++, Python, Node GYP, and make are all required in order to build FFmpeg node, right? Because it's taking C code, it's compiling it on your system, and then it's exposing those headers to your local node instance so that you can use compiled C code from node. Now, all of these things are required to build FFmpeg node, but once it's built, it's a binary. And you don't need the C++ compiler. You don't need Python. You don't need Node GYP. You don't need any of these build tools during runtime. So actually, in Docker, what you want to do whenever you're using uh, packages that sort of need to be compiled is you don't want to include the entire compiler tool chain in your final image. So the way you would do that is you do uh, you know, apt update, as always. Um, then you would install your compiler tool chain apt install dash y. And you also want no uh, install recommends, because that prevents it from installing like a bunch of extra stuff that you don't need. Then you would do npm install ffmpeg uh, node, or, or whatever other uh, you know, C++ dependent packages. This is also the case for Python. So a good example would be um, uh, libpq dev, I think it is, for, for Postgres bindings. Um, so you would install all that stuff. Then immediately after that, in the same line, remember it can't be another line or it'll be a new layer, you have to remove G++, Python, Node GYP, and make. That's one way to do it. Remember, the intention is we don't want to include the build tools in the final image. So now, back to multi-stage images. Uh, what are those? So another way to do it, is you have two separate images. So we use one image to build all of our stuff. Oops. Let's say from uh, Python 3 or Python 3 dash um, sim buster as builder. So you name your image at the top. Then you install your build tools. Um, you install. Uh, Let's say work to your app. So you install all the build tools, and then you install the packages that need to be built. And now you're going to have here, inside of app, you're going to have node modules. And inside of node modules, you'll have ffmpeg node um, with all your compiled stuff in here. But your system also still has you know, the, the C, G++ compiler. It still has make. It still has all this other crap. So now we create a second image. We do from Python 3 slim buster. And here we, uh, we add our app. And then we copy from builder, copy app node modules into our local app node modules. And then uh, you know you run, and you have the, the, the rest of your Docker file is here. So what does this do? We've essentially created an image just to build the couple packages that need to be compiled, uh, and all of our node packages. Uh, there's one thing missing here. 
copy package.json into app package.json. So this would just be npm install here, right? Because it's it's we want to install all of our packages in node modules. So then this image only copies node modules out of this image and puts it in app. And now the final image will only be these layers. So it actually throws away this entire image. And the only thing it keeps from this image is the node modules folder. So it's a way of guaranteeing that you're not including extra stuff that you don't need in your image. If you build all of the stuff in a first stage, and then you copy only the things that were built out into your final image, uh, your, your resulting images will be much, much, much smaller. Um, and this often saves uh, like an order of magnitude in image size. You can go from, from having an image that's two or three gigabytes, because it includes all this extra compiler uh, you know, tool chain crap, to having an image that's like 200 megabytes in the end. So understanding multi-stage multi builds is, uh, is important as your projects get bigger. For a small project like uh, like Matchmaker, it's it's not so important yet because you're also using the same image for development and production. So you, you really don't need to slim down your images that much. But it's something to understand uh, as you get more into advanced Docker. OK, now let's talk about user setup permissions, uh, UID, GID. Um, what are all these things? So how do permissions work in Docker? Um, it's important to know that there are two stages to a Docker build. Or, or using Docker. There's the build phase, and then there's the run phase. And they're totally separate. When you're building a container, by default, in the build process, everything executes as root. When you run the container, by default, everything also executes as root. But you can change the user used to build it and the user used in runtime um, independently uh, or together. It's up to you. And you can choose when to drop down to a non-root user um, whenever you want. And so that power is sort of up to you. And you have to know how to do it uh, wisely. So in this image, we'll see it's root by default, right? So this is root. This is run as root. This is run as root. Apt installing packages has to be run as root. So it's important we keep this as root. We add all of our code. Uh, we install the packages. Um, we do all this. And then down here, we can drop down to a non-root user. We could say user archive box. And that means everything from here on down gets executed as the user archive box. And the user at runtime will also be archive box. That's generally a good practice. You generally do not want to run stuff in Docker as root because there exist um, security exploits that let you get out of a container if you're a root within the container. So the one thing you should take away about Docker permissions and security is that you never want to run things inside of your Docker containers as root. So always try to drop down to a non-root user if possible. OK, so then why didn't I do this? Why didn't I do that in this image? You know, I just talked about why running as non-root is so important, and yet we don't actually see a user line anywhere in this image. So it appears everything here is running as root. Yeah, that's actually true, because running as root introduces a bunch of uh, Running as non-root early on introduces a bunch of usability problems to the end users who have to use your Docker container at runtime. So what do I mean by that? So let's say I drop down to user archive box here. This would mean that all of these packages from requirements.txt installed at this step would be installed with this user's permissions, which means that at runtime, the user running the app, you know, running manage.py run server or whatever, can actually modify the packages that we're depending on. So you actually don't want to do it so early. right? We want to do it later, because when we install the packages, we want the packages to be installed as root so that the user running the app is not able to modify the packages. In general, you want the user running your code and the user writing your code to be different. You don't want the user running your code to be able to modify the code base um, at runtime. So you want to put this later than when you install your packages. OK, you might ask, uh, you know, why don't I have user down here then? Uh, you know, It looks like I'm running manage.py as root right here. And yeah, that's actually true. Because I, um, in this project, have what's called an entry point script. And an entry point is something that gets run regardless of what command uh, you use to run your image. So there are a few there are a few ways to run uh, a Docker image. So let's say Docker run uh, dash it Ubuntu bin bash. Uh, 
Um, dash IT means interactive. So it means uh, it's going to give us a shell that we can actually type into. We're not just running a one-off command. So now I'm in the shell. And if I do who am I, I'm going to be root. So when this container launches, when any container launches, the first thing it does is it runs the entry point. And then it passes whatever arguments you pass here as arguments to the entry point script. So I believe the entry point for the Ubuntu image is actually bin bash. So under the hood, what it's doing is bin bash dash C, and then it's taking the thing that we passed as arguments and passing it to that. So th remember, the entry point always gets run. You cannot override the entry point, um, or at least it's not easy to and not recommended. But the command does get overwritten. Um, so this is a little bit of a tangent on permissions, but it's important to understand. So I think the uh, the Ubuntu image is something like this. Entry point, oops, uh, bin bash, dash C, and then the command, uh, is empty, or maybe it's uh, you know just echo. And then when you actually run it, let's say we do, uh, if we run it with no arguments, it would run runs bin bash uh, whoops dash c echo. Now if we were to run it with uh, you know echo high. Whatever gets passed as the argument to Docker run overrides the command. So that would run bin bash dash c um, echo high. It wouldn't run echo echo high. Um, does that make sense? So the command is the default if you don't specify anything. And the entry point is the mandatory thing that it always runs. So in my script, I have the entry point as this Docker entry point script, which I'll explain in a second. This Docker entry point script handles dropping down from root to the archive box user and setting up the permissions correctly. But then all of the arguments to this entry point um, get run uh, in the container. So what this container wants to do, this archive box container, is run run server 000 5000. But we don't just run it directly. We pass that to the entry point. So the entry point is the sort of handler script uh, that handles sort of wraps the command that you want to run. And the command is the default command that gets run if you don't pass anything. So let's look at this entry point script. Why do we have this entry point script? And what does it have to do with root and non-root? Uh, yeah. OK. So remember how I said outside of a container, your non-root user is mapped to root UID 0 inside the container. Um, now. Why would that be a problem? So let's imagine inside the container, um, we create a user, um, user add Django. Now we chmod dash r, or uh, sorry, chown dash r Django Django, the entire code base. Unfortunately, because when you mount a volume into a Docker container, it maps your user IDs outside the container to user IDs inside the container. When you chone stuff inside the container, it also chones the stuff outside the container. And the Django user that you created inside of your container likely doesn't exist on the host machine. And so you'll get garbage users uh, on your host machine. So let's try this. Let's, let's do a Docker run, and let's mount a volume. Um, let's say test. And let's mount this uh, inside in the app directory. And then we're going to drop in, and let's say user add Django. Now we're going to execute as Django. We're going to go into the app directory, and we're going to touch a file, touch high. Now this is outside Docker. We're going to go into that test folder, and we're going to LL and see who owns that. Um, oh, shoot. This is different on Mac and Linux. Um, I should be doing this on Linux. Um, on Mac, it correctly, it correctly maps to squash and staff, because technically on Mac, Docker is running inside a VM, and the VM ignores all permissions and just fixes it for you. On Linux, this is slightly more complicated. Um, but the gist of it is that if, if we chone this file um, as Django, hi, 
um, uh, the user ID of Django is a thousand inside the container. And when we chone Django, it's also setting the user ID of that file to a thousand outside of the container. And so if you are not UID 1000 outside of the container, suddenly you'll no, no, no longer be able to write to your own files. So this is why we have the entry point. Because if we naively, in our Docker file, drop down to you know, user Django, and that user ever writes to files inside of our app, then those files all of a sudden become unwritable by anyone else on the host system. So it's really painful to do development in Docker when every time you run a Docker command, you can no longer read or write your files outside of Docker. So instead of doing user uh, in your Docker file and sort of forcing that user, um, instead we use this entry point script. And the entry point script takes a user that we made during the build process. So you notice here how I create the user during the build process. And I don't actually chone anything to this user. You see how this user isn't actually used anywhere else in this Docker file. All we're doing is creating it here. But then inside of the entry point script, we take that user and we check. OK, in the mounted volumes, are things readable and writable by this user? You know, do, does our mounted volume exist? And if so, can we read and write this? And is it owned by the user we expect? If not, it ch mods uh, and chones the entire folder such that it's now readable and writer, writable by that Docker user that we created. And this is sort of how you can coerce the process inside of Docker to use um, the user that you expect without clobbering the files outside of Docker. Um, are people following so far? This is a little bit complicated. Um, and, and part of it is just practice. Like, you got to set up a couple of containers and test all of the different variances of this. Um, give me a thumbs up if, if, uh, if this is OK or if, if, uh, if, you're, if you're confused by permissions still, give me a, a hand wave or a thumbs down. OK. Uh, I'll move on, and I'll, I'll just talk about permissions a little bit more, and then I'll move on for the sake of time. Um, and then we can split up the rest of this uh, talk into the workshop tomorrow. So inside of this entry point script, we have choned all of the things that we might need to write to use the user that we pre-created here in this Docker file. Great. That solves the problem of the Docker user being able to read and write these things. Right? Because if everything's created as root, and then we drop down to Django, but we chone all this, if all the stuff is still owned by root, then our Django user won't be able to write to it. So instead, we chone all the stuff to be owned by the Django user. And then down here, using Gosu, which is basically sudo, it's sudo for Docker, we drop down to that Django user, and we execute all the commands as that Django user. Aha, but this doesn't actually solve the problem of the user on the host not being able to read and write the files after we chone them inside of Docker. Remember, chone inside of Docker affects the user ID and group ID of the real files on the host. So if we do chone in here, we're causing that same problem all over again, where the host user is unable to going to be read and write to data dear. And this is absolutely correct. This is what we ran into with our matchmaker project. And the solution to that is to use PUID and GUID. So PUID and PGID are a, a convention. They're not built into Docker, but it's a convention created by LinuxServer.io, uh, which is a standard uh, uh, organization that creates uh, Docker images for tons of different projects. Um, they're, they're often looked at as the gold standard of how to do Docker properly. And these are environment variables that are passed in, and they're not used at build time. They don't matter at build time. right? We just create a user. We don't really care what UID it has at build time, because we're not actually using this user for anything at build time. But at runtime, we check the user ID and GID of this user before we chone anything. And we use the environment variables passed in to update the user that we created to have the PUID and GID that we pass in. And this way, if your host user, let's say, you know, who am I on the host, uh, returns squash. And this has a user 1001 and a group ID 1001. Now, when we run Docker, we could do docker run dash e p uh, uid equals 1001 dash e g uid equals 1001. Now, at runtime, when it goes into our entry point script, it'll update the user and group to have exactly this p uid and g uid. Then it'll go down here and it'll check, OK, does our folder have this p uid and g uid? If not, it'll chone it. 
But this time when it chones it, it has exactly the same PUID and GUID as our host user. And so we no longer have the problem of the host user not being able to read and write to those files. So the PUID and GUID fix the problem of the host user and the user inside of Docker having different PUIDs and GIDs and fighting with each other over permissions. Now, unfortunately, setting PUID and GUID is a bit of a pain, right? You got to add these dash E flags every time you run Docker. Not to mention, the actual numbers here are going to be different on every system. On my Mac OS system, it's going to be 500. On someone else's Linux system, it's going to be 1,001. Or you know, if they already have another user, it's going to be 1,002. So unfortunately, you can't bake these numbers in at build time. Um, you have to allow users to configure them at runtime, and it's a little bit of a pain. So generally, uh, in practice, you probably won't set PUID and GUID unless you're having permissions problems on Linux, in which case, you'll set it using a .env file um, only on your local machine, and you're not going to share those numbers with other people. And the end result of all this is that the final command being run inside the container will always be run as a non-privileged, non-root user. That's very important. And that non-privileged, non-root user is going to match the UID and GID of the non-privileged, non-root user on the host. And that way, all the files read and written by both of them will stay readable and writable by both of them across the container boundary. And everything from this point on gets executed as that non-privileged user. Remember, this is the entry point script. So everything that goes through the entry point is forced to go through the entry point script. And any commands are executed in here. So any commands will be executed by this, this uh, non-privileged user. So that's, that's an overview of why we use PUID, PGID, and the most common permission problem you run into, which is permissions on the host files and container files um, being different and fighting with each other. Um, OK. So let's go back to the Docker file. Uh, we finish off this Docker file section. So you've noticed in this Docker file, we have add here. Uh, but we also have copy, and we also have volume. So what's the difference between these? And why would you use one over the other? So copy and add are basically the same. Um, in general, uh, don't worry about the difference between the two. Copy gives you some extra arguments. So for, uh, remember when we were talking about multi-stage builds, um, you know, copying stuff from, from one image just used for building to, for the other for your app? Um, you can only use copy for that, because it takes the arguments dash dash from builder. Uh, another thing that copy can do is you can chone things as you copy them. So you can pass it, pass it this chone flag. Um, but in general, copy and add are basically the same. They both take files at build time and include them into your image, increasing the size of your image. Uh, right, because you're actually including those files um, as a new layer. And both of these commands respect a file called dot docker ignore. Docker ignore tells Docker, do not include any of these files uh, in copy or add commands. So stuff you would put in here is is stuff like you know dot ds store or you know under under you know, dot .pyc files, you know, anything that you don't really want to put in your Docker image because it'll just increase the size and won't help. Another thing you definitely want to put into Docker Ignore is node modules. So why wouldn't you want to share node modules be between the host and Docker? Let's say you're developing uh, something with Node and you want Node to work inside of Docker, but you also want to be able to use Node outside of Docker. You know, why not just share the node modules folder between Docker and outside? Um, that's a bad, bad, bad idea. Never do that. The reason is stuff in node modules is compiled, right? You might have C compiled code in there. And C compiled code inside of Docker is very, very different from C compiled code outside of Docker. So it's very important to never share your node modules, uh, never share your .venv or your virtual env. Um, in general, never share like compiled package folders uh, between your Docker image or Docker container and your host OS. You always want them to be in Docker ignore so that they're not copied into your image. And you want to build them from scratch inside of your image. OK, so we talked about copy and add. What about volume? Volume is completely optional. You do not need to define a volume. Volumes are not executed at build time. This statement is a no-op at build time. Anything that you expose as a volume to your container is not available at build time at all. So for example, if I put volume up here, let's say, and then I tried to use something inside of Datadeer, like I tried to like npm install uh, you know, data deer package.json or whatever, this would not work because data deer does not exist yet because this volume is a no op at build time. Volumes are not available at build time. Super important to know. 
when we put it down here, all we're doing is we're telling someone who might read this Docker file, hey, FYI, there's some state in this folder that you might want to mount as a volume. But this statement is basically a no op at build time. Same thing for expose. These are just helpful hints to the reader that, hey, this container might you know, expose something on port 8000. Hey, this container, this container might expose some state inside of this folder that you might want to mount as a volume. But these statements essentially do nothing uh, at build time. Um, cool. Um, so along that line, should you mount the entire code base as a volume? That's a really good question. Um, you know, should we add the code base into the image and include it as a layer in the image? Or should we not do that and just mount it as a volume at the end? Um, that's sort of up to you. It depends on what you're trying to do with your container. Are you trying to ship this image to end users so that they can download the image and then immediately start using your app? If so, then you definitely have to add it uh, into your container. Or maybe you're not shipping your image to anyone. Maybe you're only using it for development. And uh, you know, it really doesn't make sense to bake your whole code base into the image because you're going to be changing stuff all the time. In that case, you probably don't want to build it into the image. You just want to mount it as a volume at runtime and not have any of the code uh, in the image at compile time. The only stuff you'd put in the image would be like, uh, you know, like global packages or like the, the language or other things that you need to run the code base. Uh, but the code base itself, you would mount that at runtime as a volume. So it really depends on your use case. Most of the time when you're actively developing a project, and maybe you're shipping it to end users or let's say a production server, you're going to want to do both. You're going to, you're going to want to add your code base into the image, and then you're going to want to mount it as a volume. And that way, you don't have to rebuild the, the image every time you change a, a minor thing. Like, like Let's say you change some static files in your Django app. You don't want to have to rebuild the entire Django app just because one of the images changed, uh, You know, like your site fav icon changed. So that's what uh, a volume is good for. But remember, volumes are runtime only. They're not available at image build time. Um, I think entry point versus command we already talked about. In general, your entry point should always be bin bash. Um, don't force people, you know, don't put manage.py as your entry point because then it's impossible to run bash commands. Like let's say you wanted to debug your container. You wanted to do like Docker run archive box, uh, you know, Python dash dash version. That wouldn't work because it would pass it to your entry point manage.py <laughs> Python version, which doesn't work. So always keep your entry point um, very generic. Bin bash or an entry point that passes it to bin bash or basically just bash. And then your command can be the thing that runs your app uh, that gets passed to, to bin bash. OK, I think that's pretty much it for how to write a Docker file, um, best practices. Do people have questions about that before I move on to um, remember, this is this is part one of a three-part series. How do you write your Docker file? How do you run it at runtime? And then how do you orchestrate multiple containers? This is just part one. Do you have questions about this? I have a question. Nick, sometimes you find CMD without any parentheses. What's the difference? Oh, yeah. So, so this is the case for all anything in a Docker file. Um, you can do env. There are several different syntaxes you can do. You can do entry point, uh, entry, oh my god, entry point bin bash, like this. Or you can do entry point um, bin, oops, bin bash uh, dash c. You can do it with quotes, you can do it without quotes, or you can do um, arguments like this. There is no difference between these three. In general, you want to use the last one because it's more secure. Um, it's much harder for someone to inject a malicious uh, shell bash exploits when they're forced, when all of the input that they might, like let's say you have an environment variable here. Like let's say you have um, you know, some command here. If some attacker gets control over this environment variable, um, and it's just in like this, then they could set some command equals uh, true semicolon uh, SSH or you know add user some evil user, right? They could inject a second command inside of your argument, and it would execute as if it was all one command, right? Because this would be put in here, 
bash would execute true, it would end, and it would add their user. So just like a SQL injection attack, um, you don't want to allow like argument injection attacks. So by, by separating them in an array and doing arguments, um, this, would, uh, this would sort of prevent that style of attack um, a, a little bit more uh, by putting it here. In this case, it doesn't work because it's bash dash C, so it'll just execute everything. Um, but it, it's good practice whenever you have the opportunity to define a, a bash command or a shell command with arguments separated at the control layer, you want to take advantage of that um, and not just leave it all as a string. This is true for Python scripts as well. Like in Python, if you're doing um, subprocess.run, uh, you don't want to do subprocess.run you know, some command here. You want to do subprocess.run like this, some command here. And that way, when you pass a variable, uh, you know, like some var here, you don't run the risk of it being executed as if it's a whole bash command. Mm, one other question. When you define command in a Docker file, which ones get uh, like precedence? The one on the Docker container or the one on the Docker Compose file? Yeah, good question. So everything in the Docker file is a default, and everything at runtime overrides it. So a Docker Compose file always overrides a Docker file. And a Docker Compose command, so Docker Compose run, you know, dash dash environment, uh, uh, you know, ABC equals DEF always overrides both the Docker Compose file and the Docker file. So the precedence order is CLI args, then Docker Compose, Compose file, then Docker file defaults. Can you find entry point in Docker file also? I'm not sure. Yes, you can, Docker but you should not. Oh. If you are doing yeah. that, it's a bad sign. It means that you messed up your, your Docker file somehow. Because your entry point should always be bin bash. So if you have to redefine it to be something other than bin bash, then you've messed up. Like there's almost no valid case to override entry point. You should always just um, either do your thing within bash or fix the Docker file itself so that the entry point has been bash, and then you can run anything as the command. That's a good question, though. I'm going to add this to the list. Same for runtime commands like suppose. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, same thing. Docker compose overrides the Docker file. It's the same for everything. It's always the Docker compose file overrides the Docker file. Oh, so for environment variables, um, the precedence order is um, CLI arguments, then dot env, then Docker compose, then Docker file. Because you can have a dot env file that overrides them as well. And but it gets picked automatically? Um, it does get used automatically with a caveat that you have to say which variables you're expecting in the compose file. So in the compose file, you might have like services, um, and then like my app, and then image, uh, dot, 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 and then environment. If you want something from the end file to be passed to the container, you have to put the variable here. So let's say um, in your dot, uh, dot env, you have uh allow http um you know everyone equals true and in your docker file you have uh allow http everyone equals false then in order for the dot env to override the one in the docker file you have to just put this here you can list it uh, you can also do this if you want but it's the same thing um, and I think you can also do uh, what I really like. This is my favorite one: is um, you can have a default value like this, um, and it's the bash, the standard bash syntax for a default value, which means check if a variable is defined in .env, and if not, fall back to true. But we're not there yet. That's we'll get to that later in Docker Compose.
Okay. Um, cool. Uh, that's probably enough for one day, unless you want me to continue. What's how is everyone on time? Are y'all uh, is this enough Docker for one day, or do you want me to do half of this one and then we can do half of the this uh, tomorrow with the rest? Um, maybe thumbs up, thumbs up if you still have another twenty five minutes, and thumbs down if you would rather do tomorrow. Uh, okay, I think we got enough thumbs down that we should just do it tomorrow. Um, so I will send you all this this file. I'm going to put it into Zulip, and I'll also post it here. Um, this is sort of the outline that I'm working off of. And uh, we'll pick this back up tomorrow around 3 p.m. EST, if that works for everyone. Um, and I'll record it as well and put the recording link in this document. Sound good? All right. Thanks, all.